everybody. I'm Fred Passman, and I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's, or depending on where you're living, this morning's or this evening's uh, uh, Continental Commandery Naval Order of the United States virtual history lecture for the month of July. Uh, in case there's anybody on today's presentation who's not familiar with the Naval Order, our mission is to preserve, promote, celebrate and enjoy our nation's sea service history and heritage. To accomplish this, we commemorate American sea service heroes and important historical events, support the study of naval history through writing, speaking, and educational events, preserve sea service historical artifacts, documents, and monuments, and promote the camaraderie amongst our companions and members of similar organizations. Uh, founded in July 4th, 1890, uh, membership is available to anyone who has served in any of the sea services, including the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps, um, maritime services, those of the U.S. or any of our allies, their spouses or descendants. Um, with that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about today's uh, fascinating presentation. Um, the USS Midway's final deployment to Vietnam was not to wage war. It was to rescue more than a thousand refugees in South Vietnam's final hours. Experiencing the hair-raising Operation Frequent Wind that became the largest rescue mission in the United States naval history. A mission that broke rules, set precedents, and gave thousands a second chance at freedom. Today, we're very fortunate to have Miss Stephanie uh, Din join us. Stephanie was born in Saigon, Vietnam. Her family, which included her mother, her father, four sisters, and a brother, were living there as the conflict came to a uh, uh, time when the U.S. was withdrawing. And in April of 1975, she and her family were amongst those who were transported by the Midway to the U.S. Without any further ado, uh, Mar there we go. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for agreeing to be our speaker today. Uh, we're looking very much uh, to hearing both uh, your personal history and your recounting of the uh, Midway's final mission. So without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to you. Um, by the way, I see a number of our attendees have already figured out how to do it. If you have any questions for Stephanie, uh, please post them into the comments block. And when she has finished her presentation, I will uh, ask her those questions. Um, in a question and answer session, we will wrap up at the next uh, 30 minutes past the next hour. Stephanie, take it away. Uh, thank you. Good evening, uh, afternoon, where was you at? Um, thank you for your in, uh, introductions and thank you for uh, inviting me here as a guest lecturer for the Naval Order of the United States Continental Commandery, the oldest American heritage exclusive Naval Society. Today, uh, in 1975, just give you a little bit of a uh, background of myself. In 1975, my family and I evacuated from Saigon to America, and we were taken to the USS, U.S. warship at sea, the USS Midway, the same ship where I am speaking from today. I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to present today, and I would like to share it with you, uh, my deeply personal recollection the story, the historic event of the Operation Frequent Wind. I remember on that early morning in Saigon, 
also known as the Ho Chi Minh City today. I could see many Vietnamese people were panicking, running after our buses and, began, and begging to get on. At one point I saw a Vietnamese lady who was looking up at me from outside and begging me to ask the driver to stop so she could get on. I could not forget the desperation and panic in her eyes. There was nothing I could have done to help her. I was torn and I tried to look away. The first slides of my presentation showing the Air America helicopter taking on the refugee, the roof of the hotel in Saigon. It all began with the peace, Paris Peace Accord in January 27, 1973. The president, the president of, of Vietnam, uh, his name is Till, was very hesitant about the, um, the Paris Peace Accord. And it's and he refused to um, approve the accords until President Nixon assured him the U.S. would support the South Vietnamese if the North Vietnamese be broke the agreement. There's item six to nine, um, especially the number seven, which is the one the one that was important to President Nixon. Return all captured military personnel and foreign civilian within 60 days. Here's a map of North and South Vietnam in 1973. The cities from between, from Hue, Da Nang, Kham Reng, Bay, and Saigon, and the protrusion of Cambodian into South Vietnam before it's the parrot's beak. Congress decided to cut the caps out the Vietnam spending, going from 1 billion to 100 million military aid, and from 2.8 billion to 300 million in 1975. And it took the Vietnamese forces within 55 days to defeat the, the South Vietnamese forces. The situations on April 1975, North Vietnamese spring offensive is successfully in pushing South Vietnamese forces out of military zone one and military zone two, a line north of Saigon. North Vietnamese forces have also infiltrated into region outside Saigon by coming south via the Ho Chi Minh Trail and enter South Vietnam to the Parrot's Beak. If you can see the, the arrow going from the north all the way down to the south there, that's there, that's what you call the Ho Chi Minh Trail, all the way down to Saigon, Hue and, and Kham Reng. The South Vietnamese forces are forced to move south slowly because refugee and their family are clogging the roads. South Vietnam forces lost command and control capability during this evacuation, which caused the loss of communication between the President Thiel and his generals in the field. In compound of that, you can see the narrow of crossing river that block the military movement from the south as well. Most South Vietnamese are forced to take only what they could carry as they attempt to keep ahead of advancing North Vietnamese forces. Most South Vietnamese uh, army in evacuation from Da Nang uh, area via foreign flagship by the United States government. I'm going to refer back to you 
the slide number four. As you can see, the Nam, which is very close to the middle of the of Vietnam, the between the the militarized the militarized zone and further south, the Nam is right up there to western part north of this of Vietnam. That's a pretty long trek going all the way down there, all the way down to Saigon for escaping the Vietnamese forces. Much of both Vietnamese army and also the Vietnamese uh, refugee was pretty much flooded down to the south. As you can see in this map, all the red is, is occupied by the North Vietnamese forces and all the yellow and blue is occupied by the South Vietnamese forces. And they also, the North Vietnamese forces, they also cut off all the rice um, lands from the from the from the south, choke up all the inf all the uh, the access to the uh, from the uh, to the uh, Vietnamese South Vietnamese forces to move forward. This slide depicts USS Midway involvement in extra evacuations of the <clears throat> Pompeii Cambodian, and it's <clears throat> excuse me. And it's pretty important at that point. That's when the USS Midway beginning to engage into this whole entire uh, beginning of the evacuations. Before the USS Midway joined the Task Force 76, the coast of Vietnam pretty pretty crowded with all the uh, ship was out there. Um, we have the USS, as you can see the Air Force and the Navy joints hand, you can see on the ship deck there, uh, all the helicopters lining up on the deck ready to engage uh, before we have this, before they have, they receive a signal to, um, to begin the evacuation. Let me go back to the slide over here, a little bit here. Um, at this point, you notice the USS Midway was already over there in Japan. So for, for the Midway to deploy and engage and join the US Task Force, 76 was, doesn't take very much time at all. And that's why the Midway was picked, one of the ship um, involved in this evacuation. Here we have a, a map of deployment. As you notice, the USS Midway back then was CVA, which is the, um, the a fighter and attack uh, ship. Today we have uh, only CV-41. Now also the Midway, for the distance between the Midway to the shorelines of the um, Vungta of the Vietnam uh, coastline is about 30 kilometer, which is about 18 miles away, it, which is not very far away. So for them to engage and begin the evacuation, it takes no time at all. But meanwhile, President um, for attempt to get assurance from the North Vietnam Vietnamese force to evacuate Americans from Saigon area involved both Soviet and Air America in invasion preparation. And you can see it again, this is the flight deck, all the Air Force helicopter on the Midway's deck awaiting to order to the to order the launch. And it's ironic about the whole thing is that they're waiting for a which you call a signal given over the armed forces radio. And the signal was the Bing Cosby singing, I'm dreaming of white Christmas, followed by the announcement concerning the hot weather in Saigon. It's a very interesting choice of song, I would say.
And again, President Ford Kissinger on April 21 was pretty much trying to uh, negotiate and also get the Soviet and Air, and Air America invasion uh, preparation involved in the whole entire evacuation. At one point, a continuous air base was bombed outside of Zaigon. This bombing was taken place by the pilots, the former pilots of the South Vietnamese Air Force who had defected to the Northern forces, eliminates the option for fixed wing transportation, transporting of refugee, refugee from the area and makes the helicopter evacuation the only option. I remember at one point on that day, why we were waiting in the waiting room at the Tonsonet Airport. The lights in the waiting room went out because of the strong vibration from nearby. I remember I could feel and hear the panic and fear from the people in the same waiting room with us. And we thought, we felt that there was not much hope for us at that point to get out. Here's uh, the, um, the location of two evacuations um, on that day. On the left, on to the left of the slide, there's a Tansinyat uh, Airport and the man, U.S. American Embassy on the right of the slide. And you notice the approaching from the North Vietnamese forces coming pretty close to the area. And the whole situation got pretty uh, intense at that time. The main building, the Alamo, used in evacuation of refugees from Tantinus Air Base, can only use the LZ-37 for evacuation because of automobiles left in other parking lots. Also, the, I remember as we approaching, entering into uh, the airport, airport itself, I noticed a lot of abandoned cars and trucks, vehicles all over along the side of the road before we enter the building. The refugee from Saigon Hotel to Tonsignas evacuation site via buses and Air America helicopters when signal given over the Air Force radio. Again, they was playing the Bing Cosby singing, I'm dreaming of white Christmas and the following announcement of how hot the weather in Saigon was. I remember on that day, my family and I was picked up by the one of the US guarded um, military buses and at the, we were waiting at the designated rendezvous point and the guarded bus took us to Tansignet Airport waiting for our flight leaving Vietnam at that time. The Vietnamese, the refugee organized into a group of 40 for loading onto Air Force and Marine heavy lift helicopters. You can see everybody lining up. And I remember we can only allow five kilogram, two bags, get on to the, the, the helicopter at that time. For me, I was, I only have a clothes on my back and a, a single shoulder bag with two of my dictionaries. I was afraid that I would be able to, to find these dictionary when I arrived in America. I still have them today.
both South Vietnamese and European American evacuees loaded together to keep South Vietnamese from thinking European and Viet American were given a special treatment. When we wait in the waiting room, when our turn came, came up, the door would open and we were directed run quickly as possible heading to the helicopter outside. And I remember my dad vividly, my dad told us that just hang on to each other hands and run. And all I, I can remember was a lot of winds, a lot of feet. And as soon as we, the door was opened, we ran to the helicopter and we were pushed in to helicopter and we were lift up by the USF military helicopter out of Saigon to the midway at that point. The USS embassy in downtown Saigon has problem with landing helicopters because of the landscaping and trees. At first, the ambassador would not allow the Marines to chop down trees bordering the parking lot but later relented it. Also, the planters would dissemble to provide landing areas. The Marine Corps heavy lift helicopter loading refugee and European Americans at the embassy. I'm sure this is a very famous scene that we all have seen at some point. The refugee arrived on the USF Midway. You can imagine the environment on the flight deck with jet engine running and wind crossing across the deck. It's pretty intense. I remember on, that, on the Midway that day, we were greeted by the Midway crew members and the ship's doctor. I was given a very brief physical examination. Basically, it was a TB test. And looking, and the doctor was looking inside my mouth with a tongue depressor. Here again, the picture of the flight deck on the USF Midway. It's a it's a refugee boarding the, fl the flight deck, is waiting for processing prior to moving down into a hangar deck. You notice the, the, the man onto your left screen with the, uh, with the, uh, the weapon in his hand. He is a, like a security uh, personnel to make sure everybody safety arrived and also security for the for the group uh, next uh, after we was clear we would step off from the helicopter on the flight deck on the midway uh, we were directed going down to the hangar deck and that's where we were assigned for cot to sleep on at that time The Midway crewmen assisted whenever needed, especially with children and the elderly. Admiral Chambers, who was the, um, the captain of the ship at that time, worried about how the refugee children would be treated by the crew. He, he need not to worry about, he had certain worry about that because almost every Midway crewman held a child in his arm as soon as they emerged from the helicopters. You notice arriving in the hangar deck for the final process and movement via ship's helicopter to deck of transport ship in task force. You notice the bearded crewman onto the left screen with his hand on the elderly woman. It's, it's a, almost like a, a sign of comforting to her that everything will be okay. And you notice the worry look of the 
woman in the middle of the crown in this life. Because she was feeling so uncertain of her future. That's what I felt on that day, on the midway. The evacuation on the 29th being over, excuse me. Everyone aboard the, the Midway thought the only job ahead was moving the refugee to the transport. But on the morning of the 30th, when Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese, there was a massive movement of refugee aboard South Vietnamese aircraft to the ship of Task Force 76. Many of the pilots did not speak English and most of the aircraft did not have radios that were set to the frequency used for the communication by the ship and the aircraft of the task force. Pilot tried to land their refugee packed aircraft whenever they could find an opening spot on the midway deck. In this slide is really interesting. Um, slide as you notice there is a tiny little spot on a slide right in the middle of the slide that is that was the the pilot who offload all the refugee and he jumped off the helicopter and abandoned his helicopter it's pretty gruesome picture there here's the vietnamese pilot uh The helicopter you see in this slide, you notice how crowded it is all packed into that little space in a helicopter. There's no room for personal baggage, forcing the occupants to arrive with nothing except their clothes, clothing they were wearing. And it's, it's it's a similar to the situation I encountered with um, that day in 1975. But you notice know in this slide, you notice know, the, the smiling face of the of the mother and two chives in her hand. The size of relief that she's out of there, no longer in danger. In order to land a small fixed wing aircraft on the deck, men of the midway were forced to push two of the helicopters over the side to make room. I remember on that day, I explored the ship and ended up outside where I saw helicopters push off the flight deck into the water. That was pretty amazing sight. I never seen anything like that before. And the, those helicopters sink, they sank pretty quickly in the ocean. In addition to that, I, I saw many, many uh, cigarette boxes, cigar boxes, a lot of contraband floating in the ocean. It's a tradition in, in Asia country that when you leave your hometown, your home country, a lot of people, since you can't bring a lot of things, so in those boxes, they're full of gold leaf. And the crewmen on the midway did not know what it was. So they start tossing those boxes overboard into the ocean. And at one point I witnessed, I saw a one of the evacuees jump off the ship after his box. And I also felt the ship, the midway slowing down but that tiny little figure of that man, a woman, disappear very quickly out there in the ocean. The major point on that April of 1975, the interesting, there is a Vietnamese pilot. His name is Major Bong from South Vietnamese Air Force. 
accompanied by his wife and his five and four children, was pretty much stacked and packed in that fuselage and that was successfully landed on uh, his aircraft aboard the carrier. And that's amazing because it was the, the flight deck of the Midway is not designed for the small plane like that to land it, land on the on the flight deck. And he did it in such a sort of perfect way. And it was amazing. It it took a lot of effort for him to do that because he had to pretty much circle around a few times before he was successfully landed on the flight deck on that day. To celebrate his successful landing, the crewman on the flight deck took a, up a collection and handed Major Bong more than $2,000 cash to help begin the family's new life in America. Did you see? That was pretty amazing. The museum has developed an excellent exhibit depicting the ship's role in this historic event. Located on the ship's hangar deck, the exhibit is crowned by an L-19 aircraft like the one Major Bong flew aboard the Midway. The original is, you can find it located in, in uh, the Naval Aviation Museum in San Pensacola, Florida. The last to come on board, aboard was a helicopter loaded with Marines accompanying the U.S. Ambas ambassador to South Vietnam, Ambassador Graham Martin. He was carrying the last U.S. flag to fly over the embassy. Here you can see the crew try to feed us fed us that day. And it is very difficult to serve the food is so foreign to the refugee, the evacuees. We all pretty much afraid to eat it because it was too strange. And I remember my very first experience of American food pretty much uh, was on aboard the USS Midway was the chicken casserole. I was not very hungry, but my dad encouraged me to had to eat the food because we still have a very long journey ahead of us. So I ate it. It wasn't too bad, but I ate it. After the evacuation, the ship was ordered to take aboard a number of jet aircraft from the air base in Thailand. While doing so, a fishing boat approached the ship, seeing that it was sinking. The captain ordered the refugee aboard to be brought aboard the carrier. While members of our damage control department boarded the boat to make repairs, Repair crew determined that repair were impossible. So Captain Chambers decided to go ahead and kept the refugee on board anyway. Here's a count of final, um, the final statistic for US at Midway during Operation Frequent Win was two days evacuation, April 29th and 30th. And pretty much within 18 hours, we're carrying 40 plus passenger every flight, a total of over 3,000 trans. And because of the, such a big number, the Midway decided to transfer at least 1,600 to other ships. And Midway served more than 6,000 hot meals to the refugee on that day, on those days. And also the crewmen gave up the bed so that way some of the mothers and, do and child can sleep in. And of course, we have some attention. The doctor was taking care of us that day. And I remember one incident happened to me that brought me down to sick bay on that day. Um, I was kind of running around on a flight deck and fell down and scraped my knees. 
And that boy, that was hurt. I was really hurt. And so one of the crew men picked me up and brought me down to sick bay. I sat there for a while until the ship's doctor show up. I was patched up and brought back to the flight deck. So until today, when I volunteer for overnight education with the children, and I saw many, and also guests on board, every time I, I see the children running around on the flight deck, I always um, show them how the flight deck can really hurt you if you fall down. I usually ask them to make a fist and knock on the flight deck and see how hard it is. And they are making this awful face saying, wow, that is really hard. See, now just envision how that would feel. And I told them that, that this is a personal experience and you don't want to, that, to experience that pain. They pretty much uh, realized it, how serious it was. I remember also on that day, my dad told us that he will arrange for us to have my sisters, my brother, and I finish school and get a good job once we land in America. I stood on the USS Midway deck and imagined what it would be like to live in America, not knowing how to speak English very well. I felt so lost and have so much fear inside. And I'm sure my family felt and shared the same feelings I have on that day. In warm, we were sworn in and each received our official social security and green card. We flew to Hawaii and to another military base in Arkansas before we reached our permanent home in Illinois. And this is what is inscribed, inscribed at the bottom of Statues of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your hollow masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send this, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. It gave me such hope. I believe it is true that you have absolutely freedom in America to be what you want to be. And I appreciate my adopted home, the United States of America, for what is has given to me today. I finished school and got a good job. And I'm now a USS Midway Museum volunteer. It is my way of paying back in a small way for what the ship did for my family. That is just one example what became known as Midway Magic. It's a legacy the museum works to preserve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. That was really um, a story that I don't think many of us uh, either heard or appreciated, even those of us who um, were in the Gulf of Tonkin, um, getting the perspective of those of you who were rescued uh, during that period. Uh, it's truly a moving story. Um, my first question, just 
you know, it, it's so emotional, but I want to ask, how far from the embassy did you live when you were a teenager? We live in Saigon. So I don't foresee it was, I don't think it was very far. But uh, my dad was pretty much certain. I remember he, we were prepared way ahead of time. And I, my dad told us that uh, be prepared because we're leaving. And we're not supposed to tell anyone that we were leaving, including my best friends. Um, I kind of re re reunited my best friend again uh, when I was in school, in college in 19, uh, nine, 1979, 1980. And uh, she was pretty uh, upset because she didn't hear from me. And all of a sudden, you know, just whole communication would cut off between my friend and I. And my dad, I remember that one morning we were sleeping. My dad woke us up and tell us time to go. So we just got up, pack our bag, grab our bag and ran out of the house. And he know exactly where we supposed to meet. So he drove, we drove to that point and we waited. And here come the convoys, the buses approaching us, were approaching us, and we got on. Before we got on, I remember my dad was talking to the military guarded bus, uh, gave, show him some sort of paperwork or talking to him. And next thing you know, the bus door was open and we got on. How much time did you spend aboard the Midway before? Were you uh, transported by helicopter to another ship? or did the midway take you back to japan no not japan uh we landed on the midway and we stayed we stayed there we didn't go anywhere we just stayed there for those two nights and the next thing i remember that we pulled into cebu bay philippine and okay. we all take turn took turn climb down the ship from the rope and I was so afraid. I was just so scared. I remember one of the crewmen actually grabbed me and climbed down the rope and dropped me off, put me in one of the dinghy little boats, and here we go. So right. you were actually anchored out in Subic Bay rather than coming up to the carrier piers. That's interesting. Yeah, we lifted, we were lifted up by the helicopter and directly to the midway and stay there. And then next thing we know, we transported right to Subic Bay, Philippines. Okay. And then how long were you in Subic Bay before you were transported to the U.S.? Well, it was a kind of a journey. We were in Subic Bay for about two or three days. I don't remember two or three days. And then we then got all on the bus. We went to the hell to the airport in Subic Bay, Philippines, on the TWA, uh, Trend Wars Airlines. Mm -hmm. and on that, we then we landed in on uh, Warm in Warm, and we remember the bus took it up and down, in right to the hotel. I remember the name of the hotel called Tokyo Hotel in Warm. Yes, we stayed there for about a few days, and then after that. It took us back, back onto TWA. We then connecting our flight in Hawaii. We were there like for a good, good amount of time. I was really sick from jet, jet lag, from motion sickness. I remember American Red Cross uh, took me into the room and got me to lay down and have some aspirin. And then after that took me directly, you know, rejoin with my family get on the flight. We flew to Arkansas, uh, Fort Chaffee, Philippine, um, Fort Chaffee in Arkansas. And we stayed there for a few days. And then after that, we flew to our, our destination in Monmouth. Uh, the name of the town is called Monmouth, Illinois. The whole population is only 1100. It was pretty scary. The only thing I saw was it's like soybean and cornfield and a lot of cows and cattle. Uh, it was just, you know, I'm a city girl. I was born in the city, so that pretty. Uh, <laughs> there, were, 
looking. <laughs> Southern Illinois is is very rural. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah. One of our uh, viewers has asked, uh, "Can you tell us you know, what's happening with your family today? You know, I, I, do they you all live uh, all over the U.S.? You close together? Uh, tell me about your sisters and your brother." Uh, well, I have one sister that lives nearby, which is yeah. in um, about 15 minutes away. She just moved down here after her husband died. Um, and then I have a niece uh, nearby here. But other than that, they all spread all over the country. I have one sister live in Germany forever. <laughs> and uh, one sister live in um, Redondo Beach. And uh, then I have one, my nephew live in uh, New York. Okay. One in Texas. It's kind of spread out all over the country. You know. And, and uh, you went to university. Did your siblings also uh, make it to university? I beg pardon, uh, one more time. Did your siblings also graduate from university? Yes. Um, we all uh, we all earned a college degree and some of us uh, more advanced degree, uh, master degrees, master of science. And uh, I have uh, a doctor uh, candidate, Dr. Kennedy in school right now. And uh, they all pretty much in engineering, engineering. So, and uh, business, except me, I'm the science guy. So. <laughs> I'm the only science guy, so. <laughs> so you're, you're at Department of Agriculture? Yes, yes. Over 30 years. <laughs> so what is the, what is your profession when you're not uh, spending time aboard the Midway? Oh, I, I work for U.S. Uh, government uh, as a training officer for U.S. Department of Agriculture and also a plant protection quarantine officer for them. And um, I volunteer in the Midway and I volunteer um, some parts of the church and also I got involved recently I just got a call today be part of the uh, poll worker <laughs> the election okay. of September <laughs> pretty much yeah and any volunteer I do is normally for charity chairs some of the charities uh, part that I like to be involved with as it comes up excellent so that's it for the questions I see. Um, a lot of notes, people appreciating you're providing this, this personal history. Uh, I, I know even all these years later, I'm sure in some respects, it, it feels like just yesterday and it, it's still clearly, um, it's moving for those of us who weren't directly involved. I can only imagine how it feels each time you give this presentation uh, to folks like us and, and the ones who actually get to hear it aboard the Midway. And for those who haven't been to the Midway, uh, I encourage uh, you when you're next in San Diego, um, block out in the afternoon, uh, even for you old salts, uh, it's, it's great to get back aboard and, and do the tour. Um, let's see if anything else has come in. I don't see any more questions. And so again, um, Stephanie is one of a, a team of speakers and uh, I'll, I'll give you early heads up. Our uh, Naval History Virtual Lecturer for both November and December will be talking about the Battle of, the Mid of Midway and um, how it impacted the war in the Pacific so many, oh, 75 years ago now. Um, why already? Wow. But further, longer than that, now, I think 78 years, isn't it? Um, so we have a full uh, schedule of speakers. We will not have a speaker in October. October 22nd and 23rd will be the uh, national commanderies. Uh, National Congress, and we will be doing that virtually over Zoom primarily. And we do have uh, four Naval History virtual lectures scheduled for those two days, in addition to the uh, 
National Congress business. I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, also, uh, please uh, visit our LinkedIn page so that you can keep up to date with what's going on within the Continental Commandery. Uh, I try to post at least every uh, week or two news about the Commandery and you see streaming below us our um, URL. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone who's joined us this afternoon. I want to especially thank uh, Stephanie. I'll thank uh, Dick Walker for recommending that uh, you be one of our virtual history speakers. Uh, if you've got friends, colleagues who weren't able to join us today, they will be able to watch Stephanie's presentation at the link that will be provided on the commandery's website below. That'll be on our page uh, called Past Events. And while you're on that page, feel free to, to click on. Uh, we, we've had a year's worth of great uh, lectures. Uh, we're now beginning our second year, and it, it's been uh, very successful. Thanks to people like Stephanie, willing and, and able to, to share their experiences or what they've learned in their research. So with that, I want to wish everybody a great evening. Again, thank you so much, Stephanie, and uh, keep up the great work at the uh, USS Midway Museum. Thank you.